Thank you so much um, for being on the show, um, Rich. You have been a long um, um, favorite of mine uh, that I wanted to interview. Thank you so much for being here. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to say hello to everybody out there who's listening in. Um, it's going to be fun and fasten your seatbelts. Um, Rich, let's kick off with um, your arrival to where you are at the moment. So your career had um, been unexpectedly interrupted by the financial market crisis um, 90s and um, 2000s, which led you to move to China. And you talk a lot about that um, in your book, in your surprises and shocks um, and things that you got. Um, you love things that were new to you. So what were your first impressions about China when you landed naive and foreign to the country? Yeah, that's a, you know, no, look, that's a really interesting question. And it was now 11 years ago. So the most important thing to understand is that when you count back 11 years in Shanghai time, it's generations compared to any place else. So look, the place that I arrived at had no WeChat pay, had no digital Alipay, had no, actually Alipay had started, I think, they had they were working on some online platforms you know nothing mobile but they had started in in 2010 um for internet sales for alibaba but you know it was a very different place and the real the digital revolution was underway or just starting but if you went there and used the internet in china in 2010 what you'd say. You'd say, well, that is a copy of Google. WeChat, well, that's sort of, WeChat didn't exist until 2014, but, Q, but the, the, the predecessor QQ, you'd say, well, that kind of looks like Twitter and Alibaba is sort of like Amazon. The, the, the Chinese internet companies were all readily recognizable as copies of the US Western big tech companies. And now when we look at it 11 years later, they've metamorphed into something that is unrecognizable. You can't look at them and say, well, they're copies anymore because they do such different things. So when I think of 2010 Shanghai, I think of uh, getting there the winter before the Shanghai Expo. And the Shanghai World uh, Expo was sort of like um, Shanghai's coming out party to the world. And frankly, um, it, it almost, you know, it's really funny, it's, and it's a great question, but it, it seems like a different place to me in my mind. It's like, it's almost like I'm talking about a different city because it's so different 11 years ago to what it is today. Rich, um, to quote you from the book that you have had um, the distinct pleasure of having the first um, row seat um, to see all these developments happen um, as you were um, in Shanghai and you went for a, a short while to Singapore. And then the moment you came back, the um, the amount of progress that was made um, was unbelievable. And, and your argument about China's supremacy in innovation is, is an interesting one. In 2019, China already bypassed U.S. in um, patent applications, um, as well as in um, top AI publications. If you look at New York IPS um, and other conferences, most of the papers come from um, these. Um, and you have briefly talked about the young generation um, filling up the um, IT parks in in Shanghai, um, and what, what, when did the shift start from being copycat to innovation leaders? Uh, uh, there was a time when Jack Ma was, you know, trying to copy the whole model of eBay, and then eventually um, ousted it outside of China. And uh, Zuckerberg uh, himself says, whenever he sees a new feature in WeChat, he shoots an email to R and D to um, see what's happening there, you know, maybe we can do something about that. And you uh, are an authority on, you know, and that's happened in front of your eyes. Tell us how did it began, you know, from copycat to innovation? Sure, you know, I think, um, I think the real um, change story, look, clearly um, by when I got there in 2010, uh, I was living in what I would call a copycat universe, you know, where things, at least digitally, looked 
like they were copying Western stuff. So for example, my online banking system for the bank that I used, you know, you know, when I went from the US to China in 2010, you know, I said, well, this is pretty primitive stuff. You know, it looks like a really bad copy. It looks like something that I would have used for online banking in the, you know, years before. Um, I would think, I think that sort of the, the pivotal moment was um, 2012, 13, somewhere around there. I mean, I'm sure that the people who, who work in some of these large tech companies would probably put the date farther back. Because you see, I'm, I'm a user of this stuff. Yes, I worked for IBM for, for some time here as well. But when it comes to retail or retail big tech kind of stuff, I'm a user. I'm not the guy designing it. So I put that to um, 2012 as I, I would say things started to take off. And I think the reason why 2012, 11, that couple of year period was really big was because the Chinese government had a special program to ensure that every small village in China had 3G service. Okay, not, not 4G, not 5G. We're talking about 2010, 11, 12-ish, right? And they were rolling out 3G service, but they were putting it in very remote villages. And people didn't have computers. And that rollout of data, plus the rollout of inexpensive Android phones, just changed the entire digital spectrum in China because you suddenly went from going online, meaning something that you had to own a computer for, had to pay a monthly service to plug it in, and it was out of reach and out of touch to a majority of very humble Chinese citizens in the smaller towns. You went from that to, hey, I can get a data plan even in the most remote village. I can afford an Android uh, handset that, you know, I sort of remember at the time being amazed because you know, you could buy an Android. I, see, I kind of remember this in 2011, 12, somewhere around there. You know, you could buy a cheap Android handset for 50 bucks, which they're even cheaper now, I know. But that was considered a, a real breakthrough at the time because suddenly people could go online and there was no reason, there was no need to buy a computer. So that's what spawned this rapid advance in digital. And I would, you know, and for me, the year that I put as this transformational year, not with regard to digital payment, but with regard to people's use and that adoption of digital would be, you know, 2012-ish, 2011-12, somewhere in there. Um, I think a lot of emphasis um, has been taken off um, from Chinese um, culture and adoption of new things um, to what China has already done without um, understanding it, um, I mean, as someone who's written a lot about um, China op-eds and columns, we've read about uh, Great Leap Forward, about the Red Revolution, Mao's Red Book, um, to a point where the the speed of implementing those five-year plans is astronomical. Um, so did you think that in 2011 um, to 2016, was this like 12th um, five-year plan that focused on uh, on br building bridges to different villages? That was um, essential part of that for especially the, the governor, um, Zhu, who is known as the China's most able uh, technocrat and his vision behind uh, liberalization of the market. Would you call him the Gorbachev uh, of uh, fintech in China in some ways? Uh, that you know, well, you know, maybe the you know, maybe the, that's that, that's hilarious. And the answer is maybe the maybe the uh, Gorbachev of digitization. Look, uh, you know, the uh, the the guy who gets the award for the father of modern fintech is the former head of the People's Bank of China, and he's still very active. You see him doing a lot of speaking engagements. His name is, is Zhou Xiaochuan, and he's the PBOC guy. But you see, when we look at 
the success of Alipay and WeChat Pay as mobile payment platforms, we got it. We have to go back just a little bit to that 2010-11, and I think it is uh, by memory, and it, it's a little fuzzy. I know it's in the book, but it, I'm pretty sure it's the 12th. Um, I think it's I'm pretty sure it's the 12th. Of it's the 12th. I got it from the plans. book. <laughs> Thanks, you know, because I'm. Uh, it's the 12th plan, and that's you know that's where this big digitization effort happened. And that's, you know, that was tremendous foresight on the part of the government. You have to understand, China's really big, 1.4 billion. And now we have a new technology that suddenly gives the ability for everyone to be connected and connected to banking services, government services. Um, you know, that's really mind blowing. And uh, the government got how important that was, all right? So they made it a, you know, part of the plan, but they recognized that these small villages without digital connectivity would always be poor, would always be backwaters. They would always be places that didn't have. And by bringing digital in, it gave the, an opportunity. And then the, the real explosion happened a couple of years later in 2014, WeChat and Alipay come along and they come along with what is essentially the killer app, which is a way for these villages not just to be digitally connected, but to receive payment, send payment, have online banking, to become uh, integrated, financial inclusion. And then suddenly these backwaters had the ability to sell stuff online, had the ability to reach out and um, join um, the bigger or larger economy in the bigger cities, the first and second tier cities. Um, and it really changed everything. But I give I give the government, you know, a tremendous amount of credit for recognizing the power of bringing digital into the smallest of villages. Let's start there, and then we'll get into WeChat and all I pay in greater detail later. But, but um, that's a, that's a tremendous and 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 noteworthy accomplishment for the government already many years ago. By the way, just as an aside, you know, I just went hiking in Yunnan, right? Yunnan is the area, the part of Yunnan I went to is known as Shangri-La, which, which is Shangri-La, which comes from the book, right? Lost her, the book and movie from 1937, Lost Horizon. Great. They actually renamed that part of Yunnan. But the funny part is I'm hiking up at three and 4,000 meters, and I'm dying because I'm old. But, you know, even in these remote, I'm in the middle of nowhere and I have signal. <laughs> and that's the amazing thing. You know, China wired up these remote areas. And I, there were a couple spots where I didn't have signal because my, you know, my cell phone is not a local one. But the guys who have the local cell phone plans, they had signal everywhere. So, you know, it's really remarkable you know, you're in the middle of, I mean, really in the middle of nowhere and there's no dead spots. And, you know, you drive by and there's a village, literally, there's a village with 50 inhabitants in it. And like, I'm in the middle of nowhere and I'm looking, I'm walking along and I see, what do I see? I see a fiber optic internet cable. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, what's this doing here? I mean, I'm in, I'm in a village where um, it was recently rebuilt and it's for indigenous populations of people who live in the mountains. And there may have been 50 to 80 inhabitants and it was a newly constructed village. But I, I, when I tell you it's in the middle of nowhere, I really mean it. And they, of course they had 4G, 5G, and they even had fiber optic internet into the houses. And my mind was absolutely blown to see this. Anyway, I digress. No, it's exactly, um, um, you know, it, it's, 
amazing that um, how fast they have let out the infrastructure and probably exported it to the neighboring countries. For example, we have a Chinese um, telco company and we also have 4G at 4,000 meter high villages. So it's incredible you know, how you can have um, such development uh, in short, such a short period of time. Let's talk about a document. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. It's called The Crocodile of Yangtze, and, and it's about Jack Ma's life um, and how it beat eBay um, out of um, China. And one of the problems in that documentary was also taking uh, government on board uh, with his grand idea of making a China domestic eBay. And it was a hard pitch. He had to meet a lot of government officials, talk to him about how that's being done in US and why does he want to bring it to um, China. And I think uh, recent events have made it very clear that, uh, you know, um, China's uh, government's interference with the Ancrops IPO, um, same with the Didi um, and a lot of uh, intervention. Now we're going to be talking about CDBC also. Um, what changed over time, in your opinion, with China's um, government policies that made them more conducive to um, these in radically innovative ideas, especially also in the face of how strict they are about having control over what they see as their domain. Um, how, how, why is that that China is coming up with such innovation in a record short time um, and government has nothing against that? Yeah, I think, you know, we have a well-established model in the fintech world, financial technology space, where we talk about regulatory sandboxes. So you can go to Singapore, London, and some other places, and they have this concept, well, we'll let you work. We define a sandbox, all right, meaning a limited area, and in that limited area, the fintech can try new technologies and inter interact with clients in perhaps new and different ways that are outside of the normal regulations. Well, I call China as a country a, a sandbox, a regulatory sandbox, because basically um, what happened during the period when I, you know, since I've lived here and, and which started well before was that China wanted digital services. They understood that they were fundamentally good. They didn't know how to regulate them. So the model is very different. If we look at the West and you look at FinTech, for example, which is my specialty, financial technology, and you go to the West, FinTechs are very heavily regulated, except within these sandboxes that exist in certain places. So you do what you can within the regulations. In China, the, the concept was, well, we want this stuff, go ahead and build it. Don't break anything. We'll figure out the regulations later. So when you hear about, and, and this is very common, you'll hear about tech companies working in China in what is a regulatory gray zone. And they're comfortable doing it. The heads, you know, the CEOs of the company are like, yeah, we're doing this. And, so, and somebody from the West who wants to invest says, well, what about the regulations? And they're like, well, we're doing it. Nobody's shut us down. That's enough. <laughs> you know, so there's this concept in China um, where the country is this regulatory sandbox of openness. And it allowed great tech companies like Alibaba and Ant Group and WeChat, which is Tencent, of course, to grow. And of course, the new one, of course, new kid on the block, um, Douyin, you know, TikTok with the Chinese version, right? So um, these companies grew with the minimum of, of regulation. And then in the last couple of years, you've seen a switch. And the switch is, well, you were once startups, you are now systemically critical organizations that are massive, tens of thousands of employees. And the way the guys in the United States like to put it is with banks is you're too big to fail. And that's true. If you look at WeChat and if you look at Alipay, these are institutions that are genuinely massive. And clearly, when you look at their financial positions are, are massive, and they are too big to fail. If they fail in any way, China is 
um, crippled. I like to call WeChat in particular because of the message messaging system, the glue that holds China together. Without it, if you woke up tomorrow and there was some kind of WeChat outage and people didn't have access to the messaging system, I think the whole place would stop. Nobody would know what to do because we use it so much. Um, so there was a transition from this sandbox environment where you're pretty much free to do whatever you want as long as you don't break anything. And along the way, if you look historically for, particularly in FinTech with, with WeChat Pay and Alipay, because that's what I study the most. Yeah, there were some points along the way where the government came in and said, look, we're gonna change how you reserve, how you do certain things because you know, you're getting big. And we're not talking about last year, we're talking about four and five, four plus years ago. Um, but there's sort of this trend, so th there's this transition from the sandbox environment, do what you want, but please don't break anything, to you're really big now, um, you're too big to fail, and we need regulation on you that um, is substantial. Um, so that's that sort of works for the um, anti-IPO because a lot of people talk about that. DD is a little bit of a different situation. We don't know all the details yet, but what's interesting about DD is that it appears that DD may have had a regulatory warning or request and that DD didn't actually tell anybody in the investor side about it, which, you know, lawyers, ready, steady, go. It's, you know, we, nobody knows what the truth is. That's what's been reported in the Wall Street Journal and a couple of other places. But um, still, there's this concept now that there is the need for greater regulation over the tech sector because believe it or not, um, Chinese citizens, despite what you may read, are very concerned about data privacy. They're very concerned about the big tech companies getting too much of their data. You know, really not too different than people in the West who worry about Facebook and Google having too much. So um, what I do like to say, and I think it's very important to get this message across, China's many things. China government, including the regulators, clearly recognize the advances that have been made through big tech, through digital technology, bringing them years forward. They do not want to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. So it is true that Chinese regulators are not particularly mindful of a tanking stock price. They really, that's secondary to them. They really don't worry about it very much. That's no argument. But what is also true, and this you can also, you can now look at Ant Group. When Ant Group went through its regulatory issue with the cancellation of the IPO, I wish I could have made a dollar for every article that I read that said that the government was going to break up and destroy Ant Group. They are going to be nationalized. They're gonna be broken up. They're gonna be unrecognizable. In fact, now we're some months after this, Ant's got pretty much a deal hammered out with the government. They're going to still exist. I consent that they will not make be as profitable as they once were, but Again, the goose has not been killed. And that's the important thing to know as we look at DD and as we consider the tech, um, the, 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 the regulators attitude toward tech. They wanna make it better. They want better relations. They want to change the um, sandbox parameters a little bit, but the thought that they're gonna come in and break everything, bust it up and or kill that goose that lays the golden eggs, no way. So be patient. I think it's such a wonderful step the Chinese government has um, taken, which used to be the hallmark for 
um, the so-called uh, free and open Western societies that, you know, these uh, companies are free to grow, Amazon, Facebook, um, Apple, and the government won't intervene unless it's really um, needed. And I think China stepped up and, you know, saw that Ant Group is getting too big for their shoes and, you know, they made the right choice, which they have been applauded for. But let's talk about, uh, to make it an even debate. Um, Many have raised concern about Chinese state's surveillance of our citizens, uh, and especially the division of privacy and the Uyghur uh, training camps have been a bone of contention lately, at least in the U.S. Uh, media. And um, some questions are um, valid, others are uh, purely uh, for the Cold War purposes. And so you argued uh, that for the most part, Chinese government has no interest in people's daily life. So if you were a user uh, living in China, they have they have no business um, intervening your life or spying over you. Tell me that um, as a user and not a, a fintech expert, um, is your life really being monitored and are you bugged by the government? Uh, I mean, is it, do you feel at some point that um, it, it, there's way too much interference from the government? No, you know, in fact, look, here's, here's my message to listeners. Um, life is shockingly normal here. So look, people who live in the West who read about China, they read about Facebook being blocked in China, and they of course read about Google not being having access to China market, and they know about the maybe the Great Firewall. You know, many have the perception that like when you sit around the coffee table at a coffee shop in Shanghai, you know, you sit here looking over your shoulder whenever you send a message on WeChat, and you know. It is, our lives are shockingly normal in the sense that um, as an expatriate living here, you really don't have any sense after 11 years here. I, you, know, you, just, you just don't have any sense that you're being tracked or monitored. Now, does it happen? Probably. Um, as an expat um, here, look, guys, look, this is a terrible thing to say, but guys um, will occasionally send um, risque or otherwise unpleasant uh, pictures and stuff around you'll get some as you know attached to a joke look you'll get half nude women with the joke and i'm you know and basically i'm like look just don't send it to me that's about the only thing that i honestly <coughs> have ever been concerned about was i told a guy look please don't send me dirty pictures okay <laughs> that's, that's it so you know it's, it's fair to say we all know that there is state surveillance here and the state surveillance is triggered on certain trigger words complaining about certain aspects of the state, which as an expat living here, you really don't do. Um, but the thing is, for most um, Chinese, um, even those with some political bents, they can say a lot, you know, even these natives who may have political uh, disagreements or ideas on how to make stuff better. They're not automatically shut down, <laughs> you know? So what's interesting is that the censorship, if you really look at it, is, um, seems to be focused on not stuff like this, not this, and things that say, look, I live in Shanghai, and we should make Shanghai better by doing whatever. That's like no problem. Nobody cares. You know, <laughs> like please give us more suggestions. In fact, what's really shocking is the Shanghai government and local government in general in China is shockingly responsive. I mean, if you've got an issue and you really go to the local party meetings. Uh, Shanghai local government meetings, you know, you can actually get stuff resolved and you can get it resolved amazingly quickly. So that part, no problem. 
The real stuff that seems to be problematic is questioning the authority or the right to exist of the government. That drives them apparently rather, that makes them upset. I don't know, I don't question, I don't ask questions like that. Most of the expats that I know never broached that stuff. So, but as I understand it from reading, but here's something else. Look, I don't read Mandarin worth a damn. I really like, you know, men's room, ladies room, that's about it. And a few other things and a few other characters. I, I speak well, but I, I don't read worth a damn. But here's the thing. So when I got here in 2011, the Great Firewall was in existence. And in fact, it was, it blocked quite a bit. It, the Great Firewall was less sophisticated. When I look at what's blocked now, much less. I can actually read most of the stuff in the US, including, I wouldn't say all, but a lot of the news. So what's really amusing to me is that during COVID in particular, people were saying, well, you know, China's all blocked off. You know, we don't know what's going on or they don't know what's going on with us. And I'm like, look, everybody's got Yahoo News here. You can go to Yahoo, read all the headlines on Yahoo News, no problem. Some of the articles, when you go to click into them, you can't get to. But by and large, um, what's amazing is that it's much more open and um, much less censored than, me, than people make it out to be. They believe it to be some sort of really severe iron curtain. And yes, censorship does exist here. And yes, some form of state surveillance does exist. We know that. Um, but it is not invasive. And for most part, when you live here, you're pretty, um, you, you, you don't think about it. It's not, it's not where I sit there on my, the, I, I say, I don't sit there at the coffee shop worrying about sending messages. I really don't. <laughs> okay, does that does that sort of sum it up? Oh, it does definitely. I mean, because that's pers my perception also with a lot of friends living there, and none of them seem to have abnormal life uh, which they're trying to hide. Um, but let's move on to something that you are an expert on. Um, you were world leading expert on China's uh, upcoming CDBC. What's CDBC? Okay. CBDC stands for Central Bank Digital Currency. And we're going to take two words at a time. The first two key words are central bank, meaning that this is a currency that is issued by the central bank. This, for those who are actually not, who are what may be watching the video, is an actual paper 100, 100 RMB banknote that I'm holding in front of the camera. And it's paper and it's issued by the central bank. The digital currency issued by the central bank is the same as that piece of paper, except it's digital rather than paper. The next two words we're going to talk about are, of course, digital currency. Now, you, me, and everybody else hears about digital currency every day. We hear about it in part when we listen to people talk about Bitcoin, Ethereum, and what are called cryptocurrencies. Okay, cryptocurrencies are often referred to as digital currencies, and it's true, they are digital. There is a world difference between cryptocurrency and central bank digital currency. And the big difference is that cryptocurrency is, has value that's based on people's faith in what it's worth. In other words, Bitcoin, you're aware, has had ups and downs in price. And that up and down is based on what people believe it to be worth at any given time. So it's highly volatile. It goes up and down with bad news, things that happen to it in the world or with the government. And, and Bitcoin changes, right, the price. 
Central bank digital currency is sort of the opposite of that. It is controlled by the central bank. It is an official currency of China every bit, or it will be, it is not fully launched, but it will be the official currency of China, just like the paper RMB will still be in circulation. But its value is stable. Its value is the same as that paper money, or another way of putting it is it's the same value as you'd find on international currency markets, where if you wanted to change Chinese RMB into US dollars or into euros, that is the value of the digital currency. And that is also, um, that is the value of the central bank digital currency. So big takeaways, ready? And the most important one is central bank digital currency is not the same as cryptocurrency. It is not a cryptocurrency. You will not find China's central bank digital currency. It's not fully issued yet. It's in trials, but so it's not out yet. But in a year or so, when it is finally out, you're not going to find it on a cryptocurrency exchange. Okay. It's a very special currency issued by the central bank. Um, uh, the value is pegged one-to-one -one with the paper currency, so it's not going to be like Bitcoin going up and down. And it is digital. Now, what does this mean? Now, most of us and anybody with a financial backing says, hey, look, money is already digital. Yes, we use cash to buy milk, maybe eggs we buy, but a lot of our purchases in the West and in other countries now are already moved to credit cards or have already moved to some form of mobile payment system, which, because you're not moving pieces of paper, is digital. So what makes this digital currency special? So to the best way to think about this is to think about making a payment on your cell phone. I don't know, everybody's cell phone is different in how they make a payment. So I'm going to explain using Alipay. So if I go to Alipay on my phone here in China, and I go and I want to make a payment to you, okay? I open it up and I speak get a QR code and I scan the QR code or you send me one and the phone reads it and I send you money. So when I before I send you money, I look to see how much my bank balance is, right? And the bank says I have, I'm making these numbers up, a thousand RMB and I have to send you 200. First, I look to see that I have money in the account. Then I send the money. Well, here's the thing. That's digital money. It is, no question about it. It is, it is not digital currency. Now, when I look and I see that I have a thousand RMB in my bank account and I see that on my phone, let me ask you this, and the answer is obvious. Is that money on the phone? The answer is no. That thousand RMB is just a number that says a thousand RMB, and it represents money that's sitting in an account somewhere else. It's sitting at a bank. It's sitting at some institution that has that thousand RMB in it. And I'm going to transfer it. And when you get it and you say, oh, I got 200 RMB, again, I'll ask the question, is that 200 RMB on your phone? The answer is no. I see 200 RMB. My account somewhere has 200 RMB in it. That's traditional digital banking with accounts today. Now, we're gonna to move to a digital currency world. And in that digital currency world, that 100 RMB note has been converted to a string of zeros and ones. So we just imagine like it's a sci-fi movie, we take the 100, the, in my case, pink 100 RMB note, and we decompose it into a series of zeros and ones. And that's the new banknote. Now, ready? Here's the leap. When you say, I have a thousand RMB of digital currency, and you show that on your phone, on the digital wallet in your phone, 
you actually have the zeros and ones that are equivalent to that 1,000 RMB. And where is it? It's on your phone. It's not in a bank account. It's not someplace else. That actual digital representation of that money is on your phone. So what happens when I send that money? I say, well, I want to send you with 200 RMB. I can send it from my phone to your phone without it going through an account, without using a bank, without using, in the West, a credit card company, without what's called a third-party intermediary handling the transaction. So when I say I'm giving you 200 RMB and I see a thousand on my phone, it's because the thousand really is a digital thousand RMB on my phone. And when you get it, you say, well, the money's on my phone. So just to recap, digital money as we know it today when we have a bank account. Ready? The money isn't on your phone, it's in an account. Digital currency central bank digital currency when you use it the money is on your phone and when you transfer the money you do not need a third party intermediary to make the change now that's what people in the bitcoin and cryptocurrency world love that is a feature that's shared between central bank digital currency and it's also shared with cryptocurrency that ability to freely transfer money without paying fees, without paying a bank, without the clear, without paying Visa or MasterCard. That's the fundamental difference. And I think that's a, I think we'll break there, but I think that's a, I use that mechanism to explain it because it's tangible to people. Money, digital money being on the phone versus digital money being in an account whose numbers you see on your phone, right? There's sort of, there's a big distinction between the two. Right. Now, it's a very fascinating segue into how this immense architecture um, will be made and implemented in China. I don't think anyone would be surprised in China if CDBC were to be launched tomorrow because they're used to Alipay and WeChat. And for the rest of the world, it's, it seems like it's a huge undertaking, which uh, it, it frankly is. And Chinese government is taking a huge um, experiment to a next level. Now, you have described in your book in fairly um, detailed manner the um, blockchain architecture or possible architectures um, of that um, system. So it will definitely not be a public blockchain. Uh, it will be a private blockchain and it will be centralized. You also talk about decentralized um, blockchain and tell us a little bit about different topologies that you have uh, talked about in your book and which sure. one would China be most likely using and what are some of the drawbacks um, and the possible uh, failure points that you can think of? Okay, so there's really two questions here and it's very interesting. So I can tell you, not what China possibly is using. I can tell you exactly what China is using. That's the good thing. But the other, and the other thing that you, a question you asked is you let off with something very interesting and it's important for people to understand. There are essentially two generations of digital payment now in, Ch in China. The first generation of digital payment was Alipay and WeChat Pay, which Basically, 87% of all of the payment in China is now done on these two mobile payment systems. And that was a revolution for China. I mean, how much is spent on this? Well, $52 trillion every year this last year was spent on mobile payment platform. So how, what was uh, 52 trillion, trillion? What's that mean? Well, the GDP of China is $14 trillion. So four times the GDP was spent in mobile payment. And you say, well, okay, that's a nice figure. How do you do that? Well, 
The answer is because when you use payments, payments cycle through the economy. Um, so you can have a bigger, larger than GDP payment number. And you say, well, okay, that's 52 trillion. How big is that? How about this? If you add up all of the credit card use in the planet, It comes to around, uh, and by memory, it's like 23 or uh, 26 or 27 trillion or something like that. So, you know, we're looking at almost double the amount of global credit card use. That's how big mobile payment is in China. Now, I'm giving you these statistics to show you that China has transformed into what is essentially version 1.0 digital payment country. It is a step far and beyond credit card use or Apple Pay or Google Pay use in EU, UK, or US. It's on a different, it's on a completely different scale that is really mind blowing. And now, having become so used to digital payment, they're now taking the second step. And that's the sort of the hard part for people in the West to get. You know, they're like, well, we've got Apple Pay. We've got Google Pay. That's really cool. That's digital payment. And I'm like, no, it's not. It is a, yes, credit cards are great. Yes, tapping your credit card is good. Yes, Apple Pay and Google Pay certainly work. They're not, I'm not saying they're bad. But the uptake and the platform, the ability to use it to do, to invest money, to, to have a bank account, to, to do all these other things is not there yet in the West. So China is going from what I call version 1.0 systems that are unto themselves completely mind-blowing in their pervasive society to the next generation. And the rest of the world isn't even on 1.0 yet. So China's going to version 2.0 digital payment, which is central bank digital currency. Now, let's talk about briefly the technology, because if, if we have listeners there who are aware of cryptocurrency, and if they're aware maybe a little bit about central bank digital currencies, they're thinking, well, it's got to be on blockchain. It's a digital currency. The second you say, as I said in my last answer, you know, we turn the 100 RMB notes into zeros and ones. As soon as you say that, you must be talking about blockchain. And the answer is, yes, in most cases, you would be right to make that assumption. But not so in China. And why? Well, let's get into this. So blockchain is wonderful technology, and it works beautifully for cryptocurrencies, and it will work certainly for some central bank digital currencies very well. It's great technology. I'm not saying anything bad about blockchain. I used to sell it for IBM. I like this stuff, no, no question about it. Um, however, blockchain has certain features that are somewhat problematic. Blockchain for security is great. Blockchain for being um, an unchangeable entry into a, into a digital ledger is wonderful. Blockchain, immutable is what the word we've got to use for blockchain, immutable. So it's got these characteristics that are wonderful, but it also has one characteristic that's bad. And that is blockchain systems are not fast for processing. In other words, if you enter something in Bitcoin right now, it can take you seven minutes, I think, to get the thing through the system. China's really big, 1.4 billion people. And when they have holidays that where they buy a lot of stuff, the networks, the digital networks are slammed with people buying stuff. So let's look at Alipay, which is the biggest of the play, payment platforms. Alibaba runs the Alibaba, the digital Amazon of China, where you buy stuff from them, right? You buy stuff on Alibaba, you pay with Alipay, right? Just to make sure people understand the distinction between the companies. So when you go to Alibaba during what's called Singles Day, 11 11, November 11, it's all ones, right? That's a big 
holiday. You're supposed to buy presents for girlfriends, wives, whatever. Sing it's supposed to be about singles, but it's turning into like a huge Christmas. Everybody buys stuff. So when Singles Day peaked, the Alipay payment network gets over 500,000 transactions per second. All right. Now, I think I misquoted before. I think Bitcoin at its peak does seven transactions per second. Doesn't matter. Forget about Bitcoin, but real scalable for comparison, real scalable networks like Visa and MasterCard, right? When you look at their networks, they peak at somewhere between 50 and 70,000 transactions per second. Alipay is doing add an extra zero in an order of magnitude, you know, 500,000 versus 50 to 70,000. So Alipay is on a different scale. All, China's really 1.4 billion people. When they all decide to buy stuff, it slams these digital networks. So the decision was made to not use blockchain for China's central bank digital currency based on the minimum design specification that the central bank digital currency network would have to service at least 300,000 transactions per second. That would be the minimum viable specification. And frankly, blockchain doesn't do it. Now, some may hear this were technically minded say, well, the new blockchain versions do. And you're probably right. The latest version of blockchain protocol, maybe Ethereum 2.0, which is still not officially launched, may go that high. But there's sort of a problem. It's not launched. It's vaporware. It doesn't exist yet. It will. It's well underway. We know that. But when China was building this system, it's in place now and it's in trials, but when they were building it three, four years ago, these ultra fast blockchain networks didn't exist. One other thing to make note of is that central banks are conservative entities. Even China's central bank, which is pretty avant-garde, pretty out there because they're actually doing one of the world's first central bank digital currencies, they're not going to be using untested technology on their new CBDC. They're going to use tested technology. So it's fair to say that uh, the People's Bank of China went with non-blockchain databases because they needed speed and that the blockchain systems of today are not really capable of handling that kind of uh, speed. So we covered two points. And let's recap because it's sort of divergent, but they're really interesting. One is central bank digital currency is version 2.0 of digital payment for China. They've already got version 1.0 that is breathtaking onto itself given the vast amount of money that flows through it. So yes, the ability for China to launch a digital currency and have broad acceptance for digital payment is easy because it's just another version. We've already got great digital payment here. And then we went to the discussion about how um, digital payment is so big in China that it gets huge amounts of volume. And in, with this volume, um, the People's Bank of China went, made the decision to not actually use blockchain, which is ready just to make it a little more complicated. While the People's Bank of China isn't using blockchain to build the actual central bank digital currency on, they're going to use blockchain to move it around from place to place. So blockchain, if you love it, don't worry. It's here in China. They've got the world's largest blockchain network. It'll be put to use. No question about it. Okay, I think yeah, that, yeah, that really, sums it up. When you talk in these terms, you know, people are totally flabbergasted about a futuristic word that you're trying to drag them into, which simply doesn't exist. I mean, that's frankly true <laughs> for a lot of people in the West and all the developing markets. Uh, for example, when, when, you, when you talk about this, there are so many questions that arise. 
For example, if CDBC opened itself uh, for international participants at some point, and now at the moment they're worrying about 300,000 uh, transactions per second, but if they were to open it to their neighbors, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, um, what would it look like? And which countries are most likely to participate in that? For example, the US has excluded a lot of uh, countries like Iran, uh, Pakistan uh, from financial uh, participation um, in by barring companies like PayPal, um, Amazon Pay, Apple Pay, and these are more likely countries to be participating, not only because of that, but also because they're part of Belt and uh, Road Initiative. Um, for example, you write in your book, the, e um, the Ernest & Young report about six top uh, countries um, which are highest in the fintech adoption, and all of them are, are the developing economies. Now, how do you think China is planning to pitch it to trade partners as well as technological uh, capacity to uh, welcome all these um, on board? And we already know that Hong Kong and Singapore um, have been given, their fintechs have been given the digital banking licenses by China, which is a very promising step. And Alibaba is also making alliances in Africa at the moment. Uh, I was in Africa two years ago, and their mobile payment system is unbelievable. That it reaches so many people to small rural villages, to slums, and they're actually benefiting that from them to a company called MTN and a lot of others. To shed some light on um, how is China going to manage that Pandora box that they're opening? Yeah, look, that's a wonderful question um, because, uh, and we're going to take it in two parts. Um, we're going to talk about financial inclusion, and then we're going to talk about internationalization. Okay, in my last answer, we talked about version 1.0 and version 2.0 for um, digital payment in China. And look, it doesn't matter whether you like China or not. I get that there may be people here who are like, I don't like China. Got it. Fine. No problem with that, but you got to learn from China, all right? And China really launched these um, digital payment networks and they've discovered something. They discovered what people in Africa are discovering, discovering, that digital payment brings financial inclusion to the poorest and most humble people. And it, when it hits, it is revolutionary and helps them. So when we started our program and started talking tonight, we talked about how China put 3G into all of the villages. I mean, really, really small villages and how impressive that was. Well, what came out of that through digital payment was financial inclusion and raising living standards. And I ask everybody out there, to acknowledge that this is not sort of endemic stuff. This is not coming out of um, something that's uniquely Chinese. Um, this is simply giving people access to a banking network on a phone, gives them financial possibilities that they did not have before, and stimulates and makes the, the these smaller rural or remote economies better. And it's not academic, it's real. So when we talk about central bank digital currencies, one of the big advantages of a central bank digital currency, yes, it makes it easier to pay from one person to another person without a third party. That's great. That sounds very sterile, right? What you got to imagine, and this is what China learned, that a guy with a noodle shop who literally has a stand on a freaking corner with nothing there, and there's, you know, he's selling noodles at two RMB, three RMB for a bowl. He can't afford the 3% charge that Visa and MasterCard charges. He can't afford the phone line to, you know, to, for the old style credit card reader. So, you know, this digital payment in China, and it's important as a side note to, for people to understand, when WeChat Pay and Alipay came out, sending and receiving digital payment was, is, was free. And that was the revolution. And 
central bank digital currencies will continue that revolution. And it means a lot to the developing world and financial inclusion. And it's really, really important to get that, that this is not theoretical. It's real. It's been proven. It's raised the standards of many hundreds of millions of Chinese people to the point where Xi Jinping this year declared the end of abject, most severe kind of poverty within China, poverty eradication. Now, people in the West get all huffy and they say, well, that's a very low bar. Well, I'm sorry, it's not New York City. China has a lot of small rural villages where you can make humble amounts of money. And as long as you're clearing the bar, whatever it is, I don't remember the actual number, as long as you're clearing that bar, you're not starving, you're okay. And that's that eradication of poverty was in part due to, yes, China's developing economy, a lot of government programs, but part of that was this financial inclusion through digital. Okay, so financial inclusion, I think I've made the case that it's really, really important. Now we're gonna change topics a little bit and we're gonna look at internationalization of the RMB and how China's central bank digital currency can help with that. So look, everybody knows that if you want to buy stuff internationally, a lot of the prices come in dollars, US dollars. And the dollar is the way that we do a lot of international business. You want to buy a container full of refrigerators from China. Chances are, if you're in a, an African country, you're going to convert whatever your currency is to US dollars, buy it in dollars, and the dollars get converted to RMB right? When you buy the actual refrigerators, they're priced in RMB. So you have to go from your currency to dollars and then from dollars to RMB. It's complicated, right? And it costs money because you're taking foreign exchange risk. Um, we all know that the RMB is not very popular for use in trade, but China would like to reduce its dependence on accepting US dollars for buying stuff from China. And the way that it might do this, the way that it's going to, is to use the digital RMB or its CBDC as a way of buying stuff in China. So basically, if you're in that African country and you are an importer of refrigerators. I always talk about containers of refrigerators. Why? I don't know, but it's just my favorite example. So if you're in Africa and you want to buy a container of refrigerators, someday in the future, you'll be able to buy it using central bank, China's central bank digital currency, meaning you'll swap your currency into digital RMB, the RMB, RMB, and you'll send that directly to the factory and you'll, they'll send you their container full of refrigerators. It'll, and the idea is that this will be cheaper for you because you don't have to convert to dollars and then can take two steps. One, your local currency to dollars and then dollars to RMB, meaning you pay the banks twice, right? So by converting directly to digital RMB, it'll be cheaper. And because it's digital currency and it's immediate real-time payment, it'll be faster. You won't wait days for the payment to make each one of those two steps. And when you want to buy the refrigerators, it'll be as easy as transferring the money on your phone or converting the money on your phone, sending it to the refrigerator supplier, and bang, you bought the refrigerators. And then it gets even a better, it gets even better. Um, the hook, another great convenience that will make people, merchants, tradespeople want to use digital RMB is that the digital RMB will connect to a digital logistics system. So many people who import and export are aware, are aware that you have to wait for stuff to goods to clear customs, right? Well, all the customs declarations, all of the documentation for your container of refrigerators will be all digital, all on a blockchain, and it's all gonna go through um, 
this highly modernized, highly smart and intelligent trade system, and your container of refrigerators will arrive at your fa at your warehouse faster than if you buy them with dollars and you do them the old fashioned way. So let's recap here. Um, China is going to attempt, and I say attempt because Japan in the 1980s uh, attempted to internationalize the uh, yen and it did, but it never, you know, so it's internationally traded now, freely traded, and that's good, but it never really caught on very much. You don't buy a lot in yen unless maybe you're in, physically in Japan. Um, and the, so China is going to attempt to internationalize the RMB, and one of the tools it will use, there will be multiple tools, but one of the tools will be this digital RMB. And the advantages to using it for most small business and mid mid-sized business people, tra traders, who people who buy and sell from China, will be that they will be able to save cost and time and the conversion of money. And they'll be able to save time and cost through these digital transport networks. Now, who's going to use this? Well, obviously, US companies aren't going to be first on the list to use this after blocks for TikTok and blocks for WeChat <laughs> and the fighting between the US and China over technology. But the natural countries to use this are going to be both, and there's overlap between these, the Belt and Road Initiative countries who already are doing business in renminbi with China to some certain degree, they'll increase that. And the other group of countries, and there's overlap, are what are called the RCEP the countries, which are the Pacific Basin countries who are part of the regional, co regional cooperation economic program platform. I forget, I, I mess up my own, the, the acronym, but it's the R. most people know it as the RCEP countries. Um, so they are natural countries. They already trade a lot with China. And for them, countries like Indonesia have already stated that they have a goal to trade with China in RMB and they want to decrease their amount of dollar trade because it's expensive. So these are the natural countries that you will use it. And if you look at a map, look at the Belt and Road countries and you look at the uh, RCEP countries and then you toss Russia in there and you put them all as the purple color. Why? Because I saw a beautiful map that was all shaded in purple saying, these are the countries that could potentially use digital RMB and it includes Russia and it also includes Brazil and a couple of other South American country. You suddenly realize you're looking at a map that includes US, excludes the US, excludes Canada. And basically the rest of the planet is in purple. <laughs> on this map. So, so basically, it's a big fraction of the world that will someday be asked, not told, they'll be asked, do you want to use this? And if there's an advantage to a business to using it, they'll use it. And if there's no advantage to using it, they won't. So um, it's a big, it's a big undertaking. Um, the People's Bank of China as a central bank is brave and forward thinking to do this. Remember, they were brave and forward thinking to allow WeChat and Alipay back in 2014 to launch and they were rewarded for their forethought in the digital spectrum. And it remains to be seen what's gonna happen. Remember, we're still looking at a, a digital currency, central bank digital currency that hasn't officially launched for domestic use yet. We're waiting till the Olympics 2022 or sometime thereafter. First, that has to be launched and then it will go into international use. But 
for those who say, well, we're going to wait a real long time for this, I say, hold on, look to Hong Kong. Hong Kong said they will have complete, they will complete this year the first tests between Hong Kong, People's Bank of China, Thailand, and the United Arab Emirates. And they will be the by this year, they will complete the first central bank digital currency transfers between four countries all real time and um all happening now so you know so yes we have to wait a while for it but the technology that's going on behind the systems to actually transfer payment in central bank digital currency from one country with a central bank digital currency to another country with a central bank digital currency is happening now and it's and it's uh, and it's real and it's going to happen and by the way to use the digital rmb you won't have to have a central bank digital currency in your country that's not a requirement but what i'm saying is that the advanced tech to go now from central one country to another all with central bank digital currency is happening so this is as you say a we're being dragged into this modern future and China's doing the heavy lifting and they're setting the standards and they're bringing this digital reality to us all. It's bringing it to the planet and um, it's exciting and it's good for people. Look, people shouldn't be afraid of this. It's gonna be a good future that we're gonna live in it's going to be a future with digital currency, which means that you don't have this tax of banks or credit cards taking your money for services. You won't need them for a third party anymore. Yes, you'll still need banks. They'll still be part of your life. But my point is um, your money will be more free to transfer and at lower cost than it has ever been before. And that's the, the good thing that we have. we all have to look forward to. Funny you should say that because um, it's normally the other way around that the U.S. and Canada and Western countries are excluding other people from this plan. And now this purple map actually excludes them, which they are not taking very well. And we're going to be talking about that as well. Uh, but let's say um, who's stepping on Kat's tail here um, by launching this CDBC sure. Um China is going to get an immense advantage, possibly replacing dollar at some point, if that works all well. Um, who are the companies that are going to be losing the most? You talked about uh, PayPal and um, Scare. Their, the amount that they're charging for the service fees is ridiculous in comparison with Alipay or WeChat. It's only 0.1%, and that's also if you are doing um, transactions over $10,000 or something. Now, banking cards, Alipay and WeChat will also suffer the blow if the centralized CDBC is to be introduced. Now, uh, one of the biggest losers would be the um, credit card companies, Visa and MasterCard, who are reporting billions of dollars in profits um, if that were to, you know, propagate in, in the financial system. Who do you think will become irrelevant and have thus um, the most reason to, um, you know, be aggressive against uh, proliferation of uh, CDBC? Sure. Um, that's a really, really great question. And I'm going to answer it by um, having a list of losers and a list of winners with some surprising uh, entries um, on there. So let's look who's losing, you know, who has something to lose. Um, Let's look at the first and obvious entry, you know, entry on the list, which is the US. So the first thing to understand is that the central bank digital currency, no one in the PBOC, no one in the Chinese government has said, look, we are launching this central bank digital currency with the intent of replacing the dollar. No one has ever said that. What they say quite clearly is we want to reduce our dollar dependence. So remember, the United States dollar is used for stocks, bonds, 
it's used very deeply for buying container or ships full of oil, right? Oil is, do, is, is dollar value. So dollar isn't going away. That China's renminbi can potentially displace, note I did not say replace, but displace the dollar in Belt and Road countries, in trade with China under certain circumstances with certain parties is great for China, it's good for the world. No problem, it's going to be cheaper, it'll be better. But to say replace dollar, that's overreaching. And it's important to know that because in my book I have real calculations where I talk about, look, how big can it be? And it can be pretty big. I'll leave it a little bit of a secret, but you know, suffice it to say, buy the book and you'll and you'll get that statistic. But the point is, look, the 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 digital RMB can help China make the RMB into a bigger currency with greater use than it is today. You may not buy stocks and bonds bought, valued in RMB, but you may buy those containers full of refrigerators or other products and services from China, and you'll gladly pay an RMB. So the dollar is a loser to some extent, okay? But there's another one in there. Most people don't really think about, about it very much, but when we transfer currency from one country to another, we use a banking system called SWIFT. So if I send money from China to the US or the other way around or between two countries, we have to pay a fee. And we pay the fee to the bank and then the bank takes some of that fee and they send it on to another company. And that company is called SWIFT and they're in Luxembourg and they are the world's premier currency transfer. They're actually a messaging system. It's complicated how it works, but they send messages for money to be sent into certain accounts where you want it to be. Now, nothing wrong with that, except that the new central bank digital currency doesn't use SWIFT. So they are losers because to a certain degree, their amount of volume of currency transactions will go down. Now think about it. When I said before, you go from, if you're an African country, you go from your native African currency into dollars and then from dollars into renminbi. These are all transactions that are carried on SWIFT. Two, there's actually two, two times that you know SWIFT is making money on that transaction. So SWIFT will be a loser, but there's something else and you mentioned it, and that is sanctions. So SWIFT, basically has a list of some 8,000 entities that is growing by the day. And these are some really bad people. And they include um, entities that are known to sell drugs and um, entities that are known for money laundering for very bad people. And that's arguably a good feature of SWIFT. Sanctions, but then we get into the area of sanctions where we say, well, and look, this is not news to anybody. You know, the United States doesn't want stuff to be sold to Iran. The US doesn't want stuff to be sold to Cuba. These are areas where countries have out real disagreements with one another of who should be on a sanctions list. So, at the end of the Trump administration, um, toward the end, the, there were sanctions placed on 60 different Chinese companies. Some of them are infrastructure builders. They build ports and they build other stuff. And the Chinese obviously disagreed with that and said, you should not have sanctions. Why are you making it so that our infrastructure development company who's operating in Pakistan, which is a great example because there's a lot of infrastructure in, with China right now, we can't send them payments anymore using that system. That makes it hard for us to do business. It makes it hard for them to buy raw materials. So there's real issues as to sanctions. So it turns out that, and this is partially revealed by Edward Snowden, that the US government surveils SWIFT 
it has certain contracts that allow it to surveil SWIFT, but it also has NSA and other surveillance of SWIFT that is less, that is not regulated and not particularly welcome. So look, the US um, will be a loser for the, with the digital RMBA, not just because it loses actual dollar volume, but because it loses its ability to surveil using the SWIFT system. And that's somewhat controversial, and I'm open to discussing that with somebody if they disagree, but um, you can look at Edward Snowden's um, debriefings, and he talked a lot about SWIFT. Um, it was certainly not the sole or the most important thing that he disclosed, but it was one of his many disclosures. So obviously, US, SWIFT, um, Visa and MasterCard, look, if you're dealing with central bank digital currencies, in most cases, if you're doing trade, it's not on a Visa and MasterCard, but certain cases it is, if for real, they're, they're going to be on the short end of this stick. And in general, not just about China's central bank digital currency, because remember, China's launching a central bank digital currency. Because of that, we've got many other countries, including the Bahamas, who is technically the islands of the Bahamas, are the first to actually launch a digital currency. But we've got many other digital currencies coming on. When those digital currencies launch in your country, yeah, PayPal, Swift, Visa, MasterCard, why, why does a restaurant have to pay Visa or MasterCard two or 3% fee or commission when you can now pay them with a digital currency and that's highly disruptive to them so yeah we're going to live in it we will live in a new world where essentially money transfer is free um so that's good for people so these will be the losers in um a central bank world it's in a world that has central bank digital currencies uh, particularly U.S. and SWIFT with regard to the U.S. to the Chinese central bank digital currency, and with those will be the big multi big international banks. You just won't need them to transfer this money anymore. So you know they have many different ways to make money. Currency transfer is one of thousands for them. It's not going to be horrible for them. They'll continue to be very successful, but they will lose that. So that's the loser category, okay? Now let's look at who's the winner category. So I would say anybody who trades with China on a regular basis is gonna be in the winner category. If, you're, if you buy these containers of refrigerators and you wanna save money, you're a winner. God bless you, that's great. Nothing wrong with that, that's all, that's all wonderful. Belt and road countries, winners. RCEP countries, who again can make this can make trade faster and easier winners again now i'm gonna like so you, people are gonna say oh no this can't be true and i make this point in the book but i'm going to say something potentially controversial i'm going to say that wechat and alipay are going to be net long-term winners on this and you can hear a pin drop from some of my readers saying you're nuts hold on a second you said those were the ver, you know, version 1.0 payment pay systems. And now China is using version 2.0. How can they be winners? And so let me explain. And let me pause a second. I need a glass of water to get into this because this is a good, this is really a good story. What most people think when they think of the central bank digital currency being released in China, is that because China already has so much digital payment that everything that has been digitized has been. So any central bank digital currency will simply be taken away from the digital payments from Alipay and WeChat. They think like slicing a cake. The cake is already this big, 
I'm making hand signals for you of the macabre past, a round cake. And they're thinking, well, if you're going to take, if central bank digital currencies are going to be digital in their currency, they're going to take a slice out of Alipay and WeChat's pays cake. The answer is no. The cake is going to actually get bigger. There will be more digital payment in China after CBDC launches than ever before. Why is that? Right now, China's economy is tremendously digital. It's almost beyond comprehension. 40% of China's total GDP is related to digital, has a digital interaction relation. Compare that with 9% for the UK and 7% for the US. China is using the central bank digital currency to not just stay at 40%. They want that number to be 60, 80. You know, they're, they're, they are digitizing. This is a digital transformation of an entire society. And if you want to run a digital society, you need digital money. So new payment streams like salary payments are going to go to central bank digital currency. And anybody who's following it knows a large tech company called JD.com started trialing very limited amounts, but they started paying certain employees fully in digital currency. So this is a good example of a payment stream Nobody, except for maybe small restaurants, most people didn't get their, don't get their salaries. If you're working for a company in China, you don't get it paid by WeChat or Alipay. You get paid it in the bank, normal way, right? But hold it, now we're going to start paying people's salary in digital currency. So the digital payment pie is going to increase. Now, there will be more digital payment. The platforms of WeChat and Alipay, people love using them. The more digital money they have, the more they're going to use that digital money on Alipay and WeChat Pay. So there will be a gain to Alipay Pay and WeChat Pay for the amount of digital currency flowing through their platform. Now, to be fair, it is true. Now, when you pay on chat pay and alipay or when you buy stuff using these systems you use corporate alipay and wechat pay money it is a money that is dedicated to those platforms they will lose some revenue because people will now be able to pay with digital currency on their platform so they get some revenue taken away because you don't use their digital money, you're going to use central bank digital money. Does that make sense? But overall, they will see more digital money coming through their platforms, more sales, more stuff that people will buy. Um, and that will be um, make them ready. It's really funny. That will make them net beneficiaries. I think they're going to go net positive. And I know people may disagree with me. It won't be immediate. You're going to have to go out a couple of years to see this. But even the PBOC recognizes that using digital currencies on these digital platforms is critically important to the adoption. These digital platforms cover the country. People love using them. They're super convenient. If you throw out a new digital currency but make it inconvenient to use, who's going to use it, right? Nobody. So the PBOC stated already eight or nine months ago, hey, we are going to allow WeChat Pay and Alipay to use digital currency. Of course, central bank digital currency will be available for these platforms. How much you use is up to you. So, ready? Shockingly, I claim that in the winner category are gonna be the common people of the world who will have free digital payment both in China, they already have free digital payment in China, but people in China will have even greater access to digital, free digital payment. Um, and I actually claim, and I know this is going to be controversial, that long-term Alipay and WeChat Pay will be beneficiaries. 
because they are such sticky platforms and people love to use them that will get even more actual more volume on the platform you really like to throw controversial statements that people can talk about at least for an hour when you think that you have already covered the topic but let's move on to a digression which is in terms of foreign policy and now we all know that um western where us and its allies they are not very good losers you know they're not used to it and in terms of someone like you have traveled the world you've uh met the the business people around the world you know the culture you know banking as um i mean as good as anyone um in in the top positions uh, in terms of foreign policy us and and its allies um are at the lowest point ever so the trust in us and its institutions is at, at the lowest um its recent uh, walk of shame out of afghanistan uh without any uh, visible success is one of that and then you also have um the fiasco after um, iraq and vietnam um and the hypothetical weapons of mass destruction have eroded its credibility around the world and that has definitely allowed these countries to have <clears throat> soft corner um for um china and it, it's in no position to threaten china at least um on the battlefield i mean we've already seen what happened in south um, china sea um and its rulings um it's same with a lot of other um avenues recently there's been a tweet i did that only yesterday uh, where the chinese president um has um responded to us uh, threats um that you know there will be anyone attacking the solidarity of a chinese people and country would be ripped off and hanged on the great chinese wall which is kind of dramatic but um the point is that us is really creating um a fuss about um the cdbc or let's say the china um uh, overall why do you think that um that it hurts you was so much um, that an that an idea which is absolutely fascinating and innovative they don't need to be afraid of that um and actually adapt that uh, instead of that they're retaliating uh, which has been the historical uh, strategy in the face of threat what why do you think people in western world are so afraid of um innovation that's coming out of china yeah that's a look that's a great question and the answer is um the us right now pretty much controls the levers or the gears of the world financial system because it has the world's reserve currency and that is a big advantage for them so the concept that new technology could possibly um threaten that or moreover change the technology platform to a china based platform at least in some small part um you know it's not welcome look they're in a, the us is in when it comes to money and foreign trade the us dollar rules the planet and um that was called by the french uh central bank head years ago the exorbitant privilege of the dollar it is exactly that it is an exorbitant privilege so the us wants to defend that um the us also realizes that china from when it comes to technology is increasingly a um that china and the us have what are called have what i call bifurcating technology there's the us system and there's the china system if you want the internet you get the us internet if you don't want the internet if you want you can get the chinese internet they're different worlds right so they have this they have this technology schism going on where the technologies are separating we run huawei 5g you don't right so now you're looking at it happening in the money area and um there is a sense look this sort of that's there that's the big picture which involves governments which i am less qualified to talk about than i'd like to be you know look nobody um but in the big picture you saw recently in the united states the technology block of tiktok you saw the wechat block 
there's this response that says, stop it, stop Chinese technology. You know, so look, China and US have major issues going on. There is, however, a, another issue. And it's at a level that I am probably more qualified than most to talk about. And that is just generally banking technology. And the reason I wrote the book, Cashless, is because when I live in China and I see what it's like to use the Chinese tech payment and technology systems, I'm amazed. And when I go back to the States, I see that the technology is simply backwards. I mean, look, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to be rude to anybody. And somebody who's using Apple Pay or Google Pay or tapping their credit card on the system says, well, this is pretty cool. And I'm like, look, it is pretty cool. It's nice tech, but it's 10 years old already in China. Who cares? You know, we've in China, we have leapfrogged above and beyond that stuff. So my great concern is that the technology for banking in the US and arguably in Europe, the West as well, is falling behind. And I think that as somebody who spent his career in banking technology, working at banks, um, using technology, um, I think that's of great concern. And I think that the sad part about it is that people do not recognize or will not recognize that they're behind. So here's the problem. You know, maybe, maybe the old saying that if you want, if you're an alcoholic and you want to cure yourself, you have to acknowledge that you're an alcoholic. So the US banking system doesn't recognize that it's behind. And because it doesn't recognize it's behind, it can't fix itself. So you can actually see the comments from the most senior, look, we just had one of the heads of the Federal, Federal Reserve, one of the senior governors said, central bank digital currencies are a fad, like a fad in fashion. He called them the equivalent of 1990s parachute pants, which apparently parachute pants went in and out as far as a fashion thing. But, you know, you've got China, and seven other major Asian nations all launching central bank digital currencies within the next five to six years. And the head of the, one of the senior most Fed members says, oh, it's just fad, we, can, we should be ignoring this, <laughs> is somewhat, should be somewhat surprising, all right? And if you remember my comments on financial inclusion, I can't make this up. 22, according to the Fed's own statistics, 22% of American households are underbanked or unbanked. The number breaks down to, I, if my memory serves exactly, it was 7% of the population is actually unbanked, totally unbanked. And uh, that leaves, uh, what is it, 15% of the population, roughly, if I got the numbers off a couple of points, which is underbanked, which means they have some form of bank account, but they still have to use check cashing services, money orders, and other things, expensive ways to send money around, which is a tax on our most vulnerable people. That's according to Ed's own statistics. And then one of the senior Fed governors says, well, it's a passing fad and doesn't even recognize that 22% of the population could genuinely use the financial inclusion brought by a central bank digital currency. It's mind blowing to me. So it's like the alcoholic. If the alcoholic doesn't recognize that he, recognize that he has a problem, he can't cure himself. And there is sort of this lack of recognition by the Fed that the central bank digital currency is nothing more than the natural evolutionary process for the development of money. We're going to start to roll it up here. This is important. Look, cash is great. It's been around for a long time. But remember, there was a point when cash was a new technology. And in fact, cash was invented. Paper money was invented in China. An interesting historical fact. We are going to see 
money evolve from gold bricks to cash to different types of cash to, to credit cards, plastic money. There's all, and now it's going to make this next leap into being something on your phone and it's a digital currency. There's nothing wrong with this. This is a natural evolutionary process. There will be bumps in the road. Nobody argues that our life is better because we isn't better because we still want to have purses full of gold coins in them. We prefer cash to gold coins, right? So that's the way that you're going to look about the argument about central bank digital currency someday. I think the innovation in U.S. is stifled by the um, lack of recognition, uh, which you rightly put, um, that you know they're lacking behind. And this is very evident from the comments um, of the senior member of. Uh, Federal Reserve, um, and that's holding them back. And you talk about in your book that when you receive um, executives in Shanghai, they are amazed by the fact that, you know, the things are so easy and you tend to pay for them uh, through WeChat because it's, it's frankly easier. And for them, it's like a, you, know, you think of them as Stone Age people, you know, who are, who are coming to a, a future. Uh, and that should be um, enough of the proof. But one of the things that I admire about your work is that you're very balanced. You, know, you have taken care of the both sides with all the arguments that are there to be made. But some of the things might have escaped you um, in a way that, that are coming as a byproduct of your great thinking. For example, I'm thinking about, and you briefly talked about that in your previous answers. It's not going to stop only, um, it, you know, only in the financial markets. Uh, so the, the the concept of digital payment is going to boil over to smart contracts. It's going to include the documents, it's going to include the receipts, it's going to include the um, contract, it's going to drool over in the society also. Like if you want to buy an apartment, every paperwork is going to be through the smart contracts. Your key uh, lock is going to be connected to that payment. As soon as you make the payment, you can enter the apartment. You can think of a billion usages. I mean, you go to a car store, you know, um, you pay for it and there's there will be no uh, personnel in the showroom. You simply pay for that, get into the car, start driving. So have you also thought about the repercussions of these brilliant ideas that you have put forward in your book? Sure. Um, yeah, let's talk about our, you know, our digital future. Look, I am positive that I'm still old school, maybe I'm old. I just still believe that technology in most cases makes our lives better, all right? And I'm still hopeful that we'll live all in some Star Trek-like world. I love Star Trek, okay? So that's, you know. And um, one of the things that we're seeing now, and this is pioneered really by the guys in cryptocurrency are smart contracts, meaning that, um, we can store our mortgage, our critical documents of our life and make them digital, make them into programmable entities so that um, how much money we receive or pay out is all determined by these contracts. And that's what I call digital infrastructure. And embedded into China's central bank digital currency is the ability to manage and use these smart contracts. It's a feature that will not be turned on immediately when the currency is launched. It's sort of a future feature. In other words, we're going to launch the digital currency, get everybody on it, have people happy using it, and then sometime in the future we'll use it. And the reason is, um, it is so powerful that it has to be used carefully. So you could potentially put a life insurance contract on it. You could do, you can do a lot with it and that's good. But the important thing for people to know about smart contracts is they are part of a digital infrastructure that we are all going to use in the future. So for example, blockchain, it, smart contracts come from blockchain, okay? And 
China has built what's called the Blockchain Service Network, which is the largest blockchain network in the planet. And it's being used now with real blockchain applications to basically put things like um, the deed to your property on blockchain so that you can receive it from the you know, local, local uh, municipality. So things like, um, not necessarily money, but things like, grad, like your, your diploma from high school can be on a blockchain and verifiable and not forgeable, all right? So there's lots of government uses. So when we look, I think I said before, if I didn't, I should have, but yes, I did. Digital societies need digital money. So along with smart contracts and along with this digital currency comes this futuristic outlook that basically is taking us into the realm of Star Trek where stuff will no longer, yes, it'll, some of it will be on paper, but paper will be a backup. If you want a copy of your um, deed to your apartment that you own a piece of land or a, or a piece of, or an apartment you'll simply go to whatever place on the internet hit the button acknowledge that this document should be sent to somebody and bang they have a blockchain certified copy and you're done and that's sort of the future we're going to live with and it'll be things like literally you can you what will happen is things like you're making a life insurance payment. Your life insurance policy can be included as a smart contract on your phone so that payments are made, payments are registered, you know what your benefits are. All of this stuff is going to be highly digitized, tied to you, tied to your digital identity. And that's something we haven't talked about, but along with digital currency comes the responsibility that governments have of knowing who you are. Are you you? Are you the person you say you are? And that's all going to be digitized. The EU is making a big push for that right now. Certain countries already have digital IDs in the EU, but they're standardizing them and they're, and they're launching that. But this is all part of our future. And this entire digital future with digital governance and digital courts. They're actually using it in China for courts, evidence in courts or something. I can't remember exactly now. It escapes me. But this entire digital world is going to need digital money, and it's not going to use 100 paper 100 RMB notes back and forth to people. So um, we have to think about money, and we have to think about central bank digital currency I said before, as the evolutionary of, uh, evolution of cash, that's true. But we also have to think about it like infrastructure, builds and building bridges and roads. We can't get places if we don't have a road. We've got to build an airport if we want to develop a, re you know, a certain area. And we have to think about central bank digital currency as being part of the digital infrastructure that we're going to build a better digital world in. And I think that that world is going to be better. I understand that it has issues have me um, decisions to make with regard to data collection and who gets what. And I and that's just for one. There's other, you know, sanctions you can imagine. We talked about sanctions with cash. What happens when the US and you know China or the US and any other country disagree over sanctions. We don't know. We're going to have to cross that bridge when we come to it. But I am convinced that this digital world that we can look forward to will be fundamentally better. And that central bank digital currency is the evolution of cash. And it is the infrastructure that will help us get to this optimistic, better digital world that we're all gonna live in. So I'm 
I, I remain opt I remain perpetually the optimist. Yes, and I think your book has made a huge contribution when people are going to look back um, in history and see who were the proponents of making the world more equitable place. They were certainly remembered as, um, as um, a book that is very anachronistic in nature. It was so ahead of its time. Um, it's such an accomplishment, putting so many things together, giving people um, food for a thought. Um, let's drag you a little bit outside your professional role, which is the banker, and uh, talk about... I'm getting your... scared, but please please do. <laughs> Don't be, please. Well, I was just talking about the fact that your personal accomplishments, you have traveled the world, um, you have met with some of the great people, you have produced um, knowledge uh, for so many people, and uh, you talked about that in your book, that um, uh, the woman behind your love for books and reading and knowledge and curiosity was your mother. And uh, just before your book went to the press, um, she uh, she died. Um, and I was just wondering, how do, how do you remember her? And is your intellect and your personality um, a, by, a byproduct of her um, curiosity and uh, intellect, um, and it has contributed um, towards your success. That is really, uh, I'm going to break down into tears. That's the best question anybody's asked me on a podcast. My mother's passing is still fresh. She died in uh, uh, late February, early March of this year. And I did, wrote a dedication to my mother in the book. But the funny thing is that I think the only thing that I share with my mother is the love of books. Because my mom was happy to read the books about foreign countries and foreign places and never go. And I was the adventurer and I read the book and I'm like, okay, I read the book. I want to go see the country. <laughs> mom and I were very different, but we shared the love of books. Mom could barely figure out how to work an AM radio, um, even when she was young, technically not happening. And I was always the engineer and of course, computers forget, forget about my mother ever operating a computer. But so um, I think my mom was very intellectually curious and she loved to read and that satisfied her curiosity. Um, and that part I certainly got and attribute to her, but um, the adventurous spirit that basically shows up in Shanghai with two duffel bags, drops them down, rents an apartment and says, okay, I live here now. That certainly I did not get from my mom. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's a, that's a really funny um, and endearing question. I, 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 um, I, I'm, I'm just, I, Shortest. That's the shortest answer of them all because I can't anymore. Thank you. Thank yeah, you I do asking. understand. You know, it's it's a very tough one. You know, I lost my mom when I was young, and um, you know, I attribute a lot of uh, my success to um, her teaching. And she used to read a lot of story books to me um, when I was young, and I'm thankful for that. And and, and I guess um, some of our curiosity comes from our um, childhood. Um, Richard, it's been amazing talking to you. Um, I think it was one of the most enriching interviews that I've had first on China Force and FinTech. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Minhaj, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'll just say this because I have to, it doesn't matter anymore, but folks, the book is on Amazon. If you enjoy, if you stuck through the major part of this, you'll love the book, but it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm deeply honored to be here. You ask such wonderful questions of me, including that last one, which, which really floored me. But um, it's an absolute pleasure. And um, to all the audience who may have hung in, um, look, connect with me on LinkedIn, connect with me on Twitter, send me a note. I write back to everybody, anywhere, anytime, any place. I, I always have time to write a personal note. And that part I did get from my mother without question. <laughs> um, and I look forward to hearing from you all. So, Manash, thank you again for having me on. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you.